me actually start the, the live thing because then I have to pot I have to mute it in the other side I'm, I'm live. we are both it's about 30 seconds delay between the other one um, uh, yes I can hear you hi cash how are you yeah, start the Sorry for, yeah. One second. Okay. So then I have to pause. I, have, I got it. Okay, good. Alrighty. Ready? Uh, one second. Let me share. Okay. You can see the slides, yeah? Yeah. Okay, uh, so let me start. Um, welcome everybody back uh, to the online uh, SPICE spin plastic seminars uh, series uh, led here by in the spin uh, fundamental supply center SPICE uh, by myself, Larry Sinova and Angela Wittmann in Mainz and Karen Eversus City in Duisburg uh, in collaboration with the spin plus X collaborative research center led by Martina Schliemann Burka Hillebrands in Kaiserslaut and Matthias Chloe here in Mainz. This is some seminar, so you will hear, see the speaker, whoever is speaking at the time, but you can write your Q&As directly on the, uh, on the, on the, on the Q&A uh, part of the system. And as again, it's always at 3 p.m. And we still have a few scheduled uh, for one more, for, uh, two more for, for this uh, December and then a continuing in, in, uh, in January. I also wanted to take the opportunity to, to remind people of a very important upcoming uh, workshop uh, in 2023 in July, but this is for people that want to be start applying for it now. The Gordon Research Conference on Spin Dynamics and Manipulated Near and Fiber Equilibrium in New Material Scales and Geometries that is pretty proud in the community. I'm um, chairing together with Alexi Kimmel and Alexandra uh, Kalashnikova to please go ahead and apply. Uh, it's open now for applications as well. Uh, and where actually Alice will also be a valid speaker there. So you can actually, you know, if, you know go see it, uh, and a renewed talk from her uh, there. Uh, so it is my pleasure uh, to actually uh, uh, welcome Alice uh, Misrai uh, to, to, to here. I've known uh, Alice for now quite a while. Um, she uh, then her PhD into, in, in the University of Paris La Clay. And uh, did a postdoc uh, time uh, with my, a group of Mark Styles in, uh, in NIST, uh, the University of Maryland, and is now uh, a researcher at Thales. And of course, he's investigating, as we will know now, uh, for developing novel ways of doing hardware, artificial intelligence and networks, both at the theoretical level and also an experimental level um, in, the, in the Paris group. Uh, so with this, I think I'll stop now sharing. And I will ask you to please, uh, let's go ahead and share your, uh, your show and then start your talk whenever you're ready. Yes, uh, thank you. Hi, Ro. Yes. Uh, oh. Perfect. We see everybody there. Screen. Yeah. And uh, let me get going to. Okay. Well, <laughs> first, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor to be part of this series. I think it's the it's really the most successful uh, online seminar series in, in Spintronics and, and maybe more. So it's good to be here. And so indeed, I'm going to tell you today how we can make neural networks with Spintronic devices and specifically how we can make networks that have uh, multiple layers and how we can uh, connect them through their radio frequency uh, signal that they can emit and receive. So uh, first of all, why do we want to make these uh, neural networks in hardware with Spintronix devices? So I think now we don't need to explain anymore that neural networks have proven uh, to be tremendously uh, useful and interesting for many, many artificial intelligence applications. However, uh, we have still this issue of their energy consumption. Uh, in particular, when you're trying to train them, uh, neural networks algorithm uh, on conventional hardware consumes uh, a lot of energy, which uh, is an issue uh, both for the environmental um, uh, context, but also uh, because it really restricts what you can uh, have on, a, on an embedded system. For instance, your phone 
can have uh, some uh, neural network power, but will not be able to learn or adapt. So it always needs to have some contact with a globalized uh, computing center, which is uh, not desirable. And uh, this is not a fatality because we know that we can do computing and learning at a very low uh, energy. And this is because we have our brain. And so it's, um, it's very hard to directly compare uh, artificial neural networks and the brains in terms of energy consumption because they, they never really do the same task. So uh, what I think makes sense is to compare what they can do with a given energy budget. So if I take natural language processing, which is a, a very interesting task that both human can do, obviously, but also neural networks can do. So uh, a very famous neural network uh, called GPT-3, which is a transformer neural network, is a state of the art for um, natural language processing, but also uh, image and uh, uh, generating text from images and vice versa and things like this. So to train this network on uh, GPUs, so graphical cards, it has required almost 200,000 kilowatt hours of energy budget. And this is what your brain would consume in a thousand years of operation, knowing that the brain does uh, really much more than just natural language processing. So we see that there's a giant mismatch in terms of energy efficiency. And if we try to go towards um, what the, towards what the, uh, really the, the brain as a hardware for computing, we hope to have a better energy efficiency. Okay, so we want to build hardware neural network, but there are many challenges. The first thing is that um, we, we want to do this in a way that is compact, obviously, so we can put it on, uh, on microelectronic chips. But if we want to do artificial neural networks that can do useful tasks, we need to have many neurons uh, on the chip and many synapses connecting them. And so this means that every artificial neuron and artificial synapse has to be extremely small. So uh, we want to do this with nanoscale devices. And uh, so uh, here to really clarify, I'm going to take um, an inspiration that is really from the AI side, which I mean that like neurons are just a nonlinear activation functions. For now in this talk, they are not, um, they are not spiking or anything. They're, they're really a nonlinear activation function as is done in a state of the art AI. And the synapses which connect the neurons are memories. And the important operation is to perform a weighted sum of inputs by a weights called synaptic weights that are parameters that are uh, tuned during the training of a neural network. Okay. So this is what we want to emulate with nanoscale devices. And today I will show you how we can do both things with the same uh, nano devices, which are magnetic tunnel junctions used in their radio frequency regime. Okay. Second challenge after we have the nano devices is to be able to build deep uh, neural networks because uh, to have a complex useful task, we really need to have these hierarchical structures of the network in layers. Uh, this is inspired from the cortex and it's actually, uh, it's, it's really important to have computing power. At each, at each layer, you have a nonlinearity and uh, this allows the network to progressively extract more and more abstract information. For instance, going from uh, pixels of an image to some shapes, to features of a shape, to a face, to recognizing a person, for instance. So we need to be able to stack layers. So for us, making hardware neural networks with uh, nano devices, it means that uh, a nano synapse needs to be able to feed into nano neurons, which need to be able to feed into nano synapses, into nano neurons, and so on. So you really need to be able to feed um, one device by another device and co-integrate them together. And this is actually uh, quite challenging. So if you look at uh, the largest uh, realizations of neural networks in hardware, so for now they are mostly made with uh, memory receiver elements. And so what you see is that most of the time you have uh, several layers of nano synapses. So for instance, a crossbar arrays of memory receiver elements, which are connected by something that is not nano. So the neurons are either uh, off the shelf uh, components 
or they are emulated on a microcontroller, on FPGA or something. Or you will have a nano synapses that connect to nano neurons. And in visualization, usually the neurons and the synapses are actually not the same materials. And the reason why uh, realization have been limited to this is because it's actually really challenging to connect nano neuron to nano synapse. And uh, this is because what uh, comes out of nano neurons that exist uh, typically tend to need some uh, reshaping or some uh, cleaning of the signals because uh, what outputs, for instance, this is an output of a memory stiff nano neurons. And you see that this is not really something you can put into then a memory stiff synapse and have a nice uh, weighted sum. So uh, this was something that was really missing to be able to connect nano neurons to nano synapses. And a third challenge, not only you need to be able to connect uh, these devices into layers, but these connections need to be dense. So in the brain, you have uh, 10,000 synapses per neuron typically. In AI, it's close to this as well. And uh, the solution that the brain has thrown through evolution is to be just extremely complicated. And in 3D, as you can see on uh, this, um, this uh, simulation of uh, connectivity in the brain, uh, there is obviously uh, not a plan to do this in hardware, especially that um, it's still not easy to go beyond two dimensions in microelectronics for now. So uh, we need to have very dense connections. We need to have not only short range connections, but also language connections. And we need these connections to be independently tunable because this is what uh, allows the network to learn. And this is very, very hard because um, most physical systems are really um, tend to be more naturally connected in a local way. For instance, in a spin ice, you will have uh, really this nearest neighbors interaction. Uh, and then sometimes you can have more long range connections. For instance, with spin waves, you can have long range connections and you can have some tunability, but it's really not clear how you can achieve uh, independent tunability of each connection uh, in an all to all setting. So this is really hard to achieve. And so um, people who have done large networks of physical systems, such as the D-Wave machine, uh, they use tricks of having some redundancy. So for instance, in the D-Wave machine, you have uh, 2,000 qubits. Uh, but actually, uh, they are only locally connected. So if you want to make them all to all connected, you use a lot of redundancy and you only have actually 50 spins, 50 qubits. So uh, really having an all to all uh, connection that is uh, tunable uh, independently, it's extremely hard. So um, in this talk, uh, I want to propose some answers to these uh, hard challenges. So uh, I will show you how we can use the same device, the magnetic tunnel junction, as a neuron and as a synapse, and how we can uh, use their radio frequency properties to connect them into uh, layers that alternate RF and DC, and how we can use a technique of frequency multiplexing to achieve dense connectivity. And so I will show you an experimental, experimental demonstration of a, a small um, neural network that still has uh, several layers. Okay. So to really clarify before I get into the details, this is how we're going to use the neuron and the synapse. So the neuron, remember, we want it to be a nonlinear activation function. And this is going to be a magnetic tunnel junction that we use in an oscillator mode, meaning we send DC current and we get an RF signal. And the synapse is going to be the same devices, but used in the resonator mode meaning that we send RF signal and we will get uh, by resonance a DC voltage and it will make us um, a weighted sum. And here I'm using these two devices of magnetic tunnel junctions, but what is really important is that we have an oscillator and a resonator. And so it, they could be other devices. This is not restricted to spin torque uh, oscillators, which really matters is to have this pair. Okay. So uh, why do we have um, looked into a magnetic tunnel junction? It's simply because it's a 
a very attractive multifunctional mature technology. So uh, as a reminder for those who, who don't know, the magnetic junction is composed of two ferromagnetic layers separated by a tunnel barrier. And uh, when you send a current through the junction, you can excite some dynamics of the magnetization of a free layer. And uh, what is very interesting is that uh, this uh, dynamics can be read by magnetoresistive effect, which means that basically you can read and write the magnetization uh, dynamics. So you can have a very interesting dynamics of the resistance and thus of the voltage or things like this. And so you have these nice dynamics. We have a small size. You can have some effects of non-volatility for memory. Uh, you have high endurance and reproducibility. We have nice models with these devices. They are compatible with CMOS and already mass produced in the uh, MRAM memory cells. And uh, so it's quite a mature technology, even though we use it in an exotic way. OK. So first, I'm going to tell you how we use these devices as synapses. And then we'll do the neurons and then the full neural network. So magnetic tunnel junctions as synapses. So uh, we are going to use these devices as radio frequency synapses. What I mean by this is that the input of a synapse is a RF signal, radio frequency signal. So here we send an RF signal through the device. And actually, uh, we can have this effect called spin diode. So uh, it means that if uh, you have uh, an input signal which has a frequency close to the resonance frequency of a free layer, you will excite this resonance. And uh, by mixing effect, you will get a rectified DC voltage. So this is what you see in this measurement. I measure the DC voltage versus the input frequency. And you see that I get this rectified DC voltage when I'm close to the resonance frequency of a device. And what you also see is that if I put a higher input power, I will get a larger response, which is quite intuitive. And I'm going to show you that more uh, precisely, the DC output, the DC voltage output, is the input RF power multiplied by a weight that we can tune. And this is why we say it's an radio frequency synapse. Okay, so let me show you it is a synapse. So uh, here again, I have my resonance curve. And now I'm going to uh, really send the input at a fixed frequency. So let's say for instance, 346 megahertz. So this is my input. And so now I'm looking at the voltage, so the output versus the power, so the input. And you see uh, here, I will have this linear dependence. So I have indeed the multiplication and the slope is positive. And you see this is because I'm going here to here to here to here. Uh, the, um, the resonance frequency is smaller than the input frequency. Now I'm going to change the resonance frequency. So it was here. And now you see it has moved. So now my input frequency is below the resonance frequency. And I have a linear dependence again, but the slope is a negative. So I really have a, a synapse which can be positive or negative. And I can tune continuously the resonance frequency. This is what you see here. And now the relief, we have this linear dependence with a, a, a weight that I can tune. And this is very interesting because uh, in most uh, nano synapses technology, you can only have positive weight, so you need two devices to make positive and negative. So here you, you uh, only have one device that does positive and negative, which is super attractive. So uh, how do we change this resonance frequency? So here in this talk, uh, what I'm going to show you is using a little experimental trick where actually we have a strip line above the device where we put a DC uh, current, which creates a local magnetic field which changes the resonance frequency. Uh, but of course, this is not what we will want to do in a real system because this is volatile. So in the future, and we have already started developing uh, such devices, what we want is a non-volatile control. And this you can do by having um, a resistive uh, gate above the device, which allows you to tune, for instance, the magnetic anisotropy 
and then there's the resonance frequency in a similar way as what was done in this paper. But for now, we use this experimental trick of a strip line. Okay, so I have shown you one synapse that does a multiplication. Now I want to show you how we do uh, the, um, the weighted sum. So for this, uh, so our output is a voltage, right? So how do you sum voltages? You put devices in series. So here you see we have a series of two synapses, okay? So the voltage across the chain of these two synapses is going to be the sum. And what I do is that I choose them so that they have uh, different resonance frequencies. And then I can also send inputs that have different frequencies. So remember the inputs are the powers and the powers are encoded by signals uh, that have different frequencies that are chosen to match the frequencies of the synapses. And so what I can do is sum my two inputs and then I send them to the chain of synapses. And uh, to make a rough approximation, we can go more into the details, but to, in, to understand intuitively, it's like uh, each synapse will only rectify each signal. So this synapse will rectify this signal and this synapse will rectify this signal. And so the voltage will be the weighted sum of the inputs by the weights that we control with the resonance frequency of each device. So we call this frequency multiplexing because you send all signals together, but uh, what is done with them depends on the frequency. And this is very nice because then you see, you have, is I have uh, two neurons in the next layer. So I need to make two weighted sums of my inputs. I just have to have two chains of synapses. And uh, you see, I take my inputs, I sum them, and I send all the inputs to the layer of synapse. So the connectivity is really implemented by the frequency matching and not by some wires. And so you just need one big wire basically to connect the inputs to the synapses. And so this really uh, allows to simplify the architecture while having a dense connectivity. So this is very attractive. Okay, so this was for the weighted sum. And so, yes, and so we have made a, a little experimental demo of this with uh, two magnetic conjunctions. So you see here the voltage versus input frequency. We see that we have two resonance. Each uh, device uh, takes care of a frequency uh, zone. And then we send two inputs and we can change the powers and the weights. And we always get uh, a result that is uh, the weighted sum. Okay, so that was the first realization of uh, synaptic operations in hardware on analog RF signals. Okay, so these were the synapses. Now let's see the neurons. So the neurons are used in the reverse mode. So uh, instead of inputting RF signals, we're going to input DC current and we output RF signals. So this is a spin torque oscillators. So um, for in this talk, the devices I'm showing you are vortex oscillators actually. And so you, yes, if you have a signal, a DC signal as input that is higher than a given threshold, uh, you will get emission of a power spectrum like this. And if you look at the power versus input current, you see that you have indeed a zero, then a threshold, and then the power increase. Uh, and this is nice because this looks like an activation function. This is nonlinear. However, um, you see we have a problem here is that the frequency also depends on the input. But remember for the synapse to work, they need to have um, an input at fixed frequency. So uh, to solve this, we have again added uh, this strip line. And with the strip line, we can send a DC uh, current that counterbalances the shift of a frequency. And you see now the frequency is uh, fixed with the input and we still have this nonlinear function. Uh, but of course, again, in the final system, we don't really want to use this strip line. We would rather have oscillators that have already uh, a fixed frequency as was shown in this paper. And we have also uh, started developing uh, our own. Okay, so this is the oscillator. 
Now let's put them together. So the full spintronic neural network. So first let's connect one neuron to one synapse. Okay. So here my input is the DC current. It goes through the neuron, becomes an RF power, then goes to the synapse and the output is a DC voltage. Okay. And you see here, I plot the DC voltage versus the input DC current. And you see these curves, they really look like the nonlinear activation function. So this comes uh, from the neuron, but it's this nonlinear activation function multiplied by a weight that we can tune uh, using the frequency of a synapse. So we really have a cascade of operation. And so that was really the first connection of a nano neuron to nano synapse. And so now that we know we can connect one neuron to one synapse, we can connect two neurons to two synapses. So it's basically uh, the same thing. Uh, and uh, so depending on the input currents, you can have uh, one uh, neuron on or the other or none or both. And uh, in all cases, you always have this weighted sum. Uh, um, so where the voltage is the, uh, the sum of the inputs transformed by the nonlinear activation functions multiplied by the weights of the synapses. So we can really connect layers of neurons to synapses. And so with this, we were able to build these uh, small neural networks. So you see it's a uh, very small, you have two inputs, okay? That goes to two hidden neurons. So two by two, you have four synapses here. And uh, then these two neurons go to uh, one output neuron. So you have again, two synapses here. And so you see the equivalent circuit is this, you have two inputs that you sum, then they go to two layers of two synapses each. Uh, we needed to convert the DC voltage to DC current. And so we did this with a computer. And so they go to the neurons, uh, the RF signals that come out are summed. They go to a layer of synapses and uh, then again to an output neuron. Okay, so this is a small network, but what really matters is that we have this succession of layers that are connected together. And to show that this is working, we have demonstrated uh, nonlinear classification. So what does this mean? It means that um, the input cannot be linearly separated. So here our inputs are the power one and two. So you see here, for instance, this task in the middle, we have power one and power two. And our task is this black line. We want the red dot and blue dot to be on each side of the black line. So blue means no output power, red means output power. And so you see here, it's not, the, the black line is not, um, uh, it's not a straight line. If we had something linear, we would have a straight line. And to have non-linear classification, so a non-straight line, you really need to have uh, multiple layers. And so you see here uh, these simulations, uh, okay, this is a very simple network, so the simulation have a perfect result. And the experiments are honestly very good as well. Uh, you see this case is perfect. Here we have one dot missing, here we have a few. So um, we have this really high accuracy experimental classification of a nonlinear task, which shows that the multi-layer networks uh, uh, functions. So this was really uh, the first time that a full, uh, na fully nano multi-layer network was demonstrated. And uh, also especially the first time that it was a spintronics uh, full neural network. So this was very exciting, uh, but this is obviously a very small task and very small network. So we have also looked at simulations to try to understand how we could deal with a larger task. So uh, to do simulations, we have developed a neural network simulators using the framework PyTorch. So PyTorch is a library in Python. Uh, which has these very nice features that you can uh, define neural networks based on their equations. And so you can really put the physical models of your devices in there and have your network that simulates your physical system and it can be trained using all the tools of uh, AI. So here, the first thing that we test is a benchmark uh, uh, data set called digits. So it's these little images, eight by eight pixels of 110 digits. And this is actually a linear task. So this was to only test the synapses. So you see here, 
uh, we have powers. So each pixel is an input, which means a power coded by a different frequency. We sum all these powers and then we send them to chains of synapses. Okay. So 64 inputs means that every chain has 64 synapses and they are digits. So we have 10 classes. So we have 10 chains and each of them outputs a voltage. The highest voltage is the class. Okay. Um, and so you see here, uh, we only have synapses, so it's linear. The success rate is the percentage of images that are correctly classified. And the number of epochs is the number of time that we show the whole data set. Uh, so uh, almost 2,000 images to the network and we adjust the parameters, okay? And uh, what you see is that we get almost 100% accuracy and we do as good with our Spintronic network than the software. So this was showing really that our radio frequency synapses were correctly working. And then we were able to move to something harder where we add the neurons. So we have looked at two important architectures in, um, in neural networks, one called the multi-layer perception. So this is like what we have done in experiments where you have multiple layers of synapses separated by neurons, okay? And uh, one other network that is very important is called a convolutional uh, neural network. So it's quite similar because you also have neurons and weighted sums, but the topology of the connection is a bit different. And uh, so we have adapted our architecture to these networks. We actually have a, a patent on this and a separate paper, but I don't have time to go into more details. Um, yes, and so these networks let us tackle a task that is nonlinear. So this MNIST, a very famous task, again, handwritten digits, just a larger task than the, the previous one. And you see, again, uh, we have uh, high accuracy and we do as good as the software neural network. So this really demonstrates that with our simulated uh, spintronic neural network, we can do as well as the software on this uh, benchmark task with these uh, state-of-the-art neural networks. So this was very interesting. Uh, however, we were also interested not just at benchmark tasks, which tend to be tasks of images, but also at a task where the inputs are directly radio frequency inputs. And uh, this is because, so I told you our synapses are radio frequencies, uh, radio frequency synapses. So it means that if we want, we can really directly take radio frequency signals and perform neural network operations on them without having to perform any kind of digitization, digitization steps. And so this is uh, something that is very useful because digitization tends to be costly in terms of space, uh, uh, time, and energy. And um, so actually, this is something that is very interesting also for us at Thales in the company because uh, we are looking at many applications where the inputs are radio frequency signals. So uh, we took this task where you have these commercial drones. Okay, so like for instance, like the power drone here, and uh, they emit RF signals because they are communicating to their radio controller. And so we can look at these signals emitted between radio controller and drone. And uh, so we are not trying to decode what the drone is saying. We're trying to identify what was the type of drone. So we got this um, open database online where you have 10 classes of drones and controllers. And our network uh, was trained to recognize which type of drone or controller it was. For instance, this is a Telo drone. Okay, and you see uh, here again, the accuracy during training, uh, we almost go to 100% and we do as good as the software. And so this is very interesting because this is really an application where we uh, deeply leverage the dynamics of the uh, neural network. Of, uh, of um, sorry, we deeply leverage the dynamics of the spintronic devices. We use this high-speed dynamics of uh, magnetism. Okay, so how does this compare to other technology? So uh, first thing, it was really a first demonstration of a fully nano multi-layer neural network because we are able to really uh, stack neurons and synapses into something that is modular 
and thus can go to deep networks and thus to a problem that scale. So this was uh, a very important point. Second thing, these radio frequency connections, uh, which you have thanks to the unique physics of these spintronic devices, are really key to have this frequency multiplex uh, connection. And uh, so this really simplifies the architectures. And so this is um, very interesting because uh, frequency multiplexing is something that people typically do in photonics, but in photonics, devices are large, uh, while here they are nano devices. Uh, moreover, actually in photonics, when they do frequency multiplexing, they uh, multiplex inputs uh, to process many inputs in parallel, but they do not have a frequency selective synapses. Uh, so they cannot really use this frequency multiplexing to complexify the architecture. Whereas here, it's really this unique physics of, um, of a spintronic device that allows you to have this frequency selective synapse and thus the connectivity. So this is really something super unique to the spintronic devices and very useful for the hardware implementation. So uh, something we uh, wonder a lot is how many uh, how many synapses you can put on a chain. And uh, of course, this is something that will have many challenges to realize experimentally, many engineering challenges. Uh, but uh, when we think of what will be the limiting factor, actually what seems to us is that it is the learning. So uh, what I mean by this is that um, I have told you each synapse will rectify its input. But actually, obviously, if you want to do this in a super rigorous way, it means that uh, each synapse needs to be very far from the other frequency wise. In some, like this would be kind of a caricature of it, where you see this is one resonant, this is another one, this is another one, this is another one, and they really do not overlap. If you do this, you cannot put many synapses on the chain, and so you cannot go to large networks. So what we do, uh, both in our experiments and in our simulations, is that actually the resonances overlap and we take this into account. And so as long as you're not putting a, a too large power in your system, it stays into a linear summation regime and it's fine. However, what happens is that, uh, because remember we match the frequency of the synapse to the, well, we match the frequency of the input to the frequency of the synapse. So if the synapses are very close in frequency, it means the inputs are very close in frequency. And if the inputs are very close in frequency, then this physical system that is the network will really have a hard time uh, separating them. So it means that it will really have a hard time giving a different weight to every synapse. So this is what we have shown in these simulations. This is for MNIST with just a layer of synapse to focus on this, so you only get about 92% accuracy. Okay, but what matters here is that this axis is uh, how much frequency band we use in total with the 7 and 94 synapses, which is to make the whole MNIST in one chain, basically. And what you see is that the accuracy drops if the frequency range is too small. And what you see is that um, this is really because of the weight. So here, I plot the weight of a software neural network. So each color is one. Uh, output neuron. Okay, so for us it would be a chain of synapse, and each dot in the color is one weight. So for us that would be one synapse. And you see they are completely uh, random and independent in the software. If we have a large frequency band, like 20 gigahertz for the Pintronics neural network, same thing. <laughs> and we get a high accuracy. However, if we drastically reduce the frequency range, so if we say we only have 500 megahertz to put all our synapses, you see they become very dependent. And in the extreme case of 100 megahertz, you have uh, no tuning of the weight possible. So uh, you need to make sure that you really have a, a, nice, uh, a nice range of frequency to put all your synapses. And so this is... Uh, this is where it's really good that the, the spin torque oscillators, depending kind of the type and the size and everything, 
you can make them over wide uh, ranges of frequency. <laughs> and just to clarify, because you cannot put all the synapses in a chain doesn't mean you cannot have, so this doesn't mean you cannot have a network that is larger than this size. It just means that after this, you need to have several chains that you connect in a more normal way. So frequency multiplexing uh, will give you a gain in density that is of this order of magnitude. So more like hundreds uh, gains uh, and not gains in like 10,000 or something but you can still have a higher connectivity. Uh, okay. And uh, in terms of energy consumption, so, um, <laughs> sorry. For this, we have discussed with uh, people who are um, in the process of uh, developing a chip with us where you have um, CMOS conventional electronics and this uh, radio frequency MTJs on tops uh, because this was really uh, the way that helped us understand where the energy consumption was coming from. And so basically, the energy consumption comes mainly from two places. Uh, one, uh, you need to feed the neurons, okay? So uh, you need to send them DC current so that they oscillate, right? And so this consumes energy. And then uh, the thing is, uh, you need you cannot have an arbitrarily small voltage that comes to them from the synapses okay uh, so you typically need uh, maybe uh, one millivolt or 0.1 millivolt really at worst on that comes into these uh, amplifiers that then control the uh, oscillators and so this sets what voltage the chains must output and so this sets how much radio frequency inputs they need to receive. And uh, because you're not going to get insane powers out of uh, spin torque nano oscillators, uh, it means that you would need to amplify what they output before sending it to all synapses. And so this is a second source of energy consumption. And so when you um, consider devices that are 20 or maybe 10 nanometers diameters, uh, what you get in estimations are that the synapses will typically consume 10 femtojoule per operation, considering they function at 1 gigahertz, which is very reasonable, and that the neuron will consume uh, 100 femtojoule per operation, again, considering 1 gigahertz, which is very reasonable. So here, the energy consumption is uh, comparable, maybe a bit better, but comparable to memory steve or optical devices. Uh, they are much better than uh, CMOS-based systems or graphical uh, processing units, or stuff, but compared to other uh, imaging technologies, they are the same. It's just that uh, here we really have an architecture that can scale up. Uh, the, um, the connectivity is much more interesting with, um, with this frequency multiplexing, so this will give us more connectivity than crossbar array of memory steel devices. We are much smaller than optical devices and so on. Okay, so I just have a few minutes left. So I just want to talk a few words about what comes next. So here I have shown you um, a device that performs the neural network operation, okay? But uh, the, all the training was done in a very conventional way using backpropagation on a computer. And uh, this is not what we want to do in the future. So how do we want to train the system? So first, I want to emphasize that we want to train the system uh, because uh, even though there are um, some parading where you can um, not train most of your system, for instance, using reservoir computing, these, uh, these methods sadly do not scale to a very complex task for applications. It is not really uh, so attractive. Um, I uh, I always like to show this picture of uh, the reservoir made of an uh, actual reservoir of water because it's it's just great. But anyway, so sadly, this, this type of method where you use the system as a black box that you don't really train, sadly, it doesn't scale, even though it's uh, really great to uh, benchmark some uh, emerging technologies because it's, uh, it's a great first step. But we want to go beyond and train the system. So uh, the thing is that it's not easy to do backpropagation. 
which is the algorithm that gives the best performance in terms of accuracy, it's very challenging to have it in hardware. So <laughs> let's imagine we wanted to implement backpropagation in hardware. What will it require? So first, we would need to have one neural network doing the forward inference, really the computing itself. Okay, so I have shown you an idea of how to do this. You see that it's already complicated. But then we would need another circuit that does the backward pass. So in the backward pass, you uh, come from your error. So your output, you have your error. And then you compute uh, the gradients of your network to try to understand uh, how much each uh, weight is responsible of this error. So you have to compute all these gradients, which is a completely different computation. You need to store these gradients, and then you need another circuit that comes and programs all the weights of your synapses, knowing that in backpropagation, uh, you have very low tolerance to errors. You need to have very small weight increments and things like this. So it's actually uh, very hard. And if you try to do this, you will end up with a very large circuit and you will uh, often lose all the gains that you have from having your hardware uh, system in the first place. So this is really an issue. So um, like propagation is state of the art on uh, artificial intelligence task, but we see it's not hardware friendly. There are other um, learning algorithms that exist. And so actually many of them are inspired from neuroscience or from physics, and they are hardware friendly. So often they have very interesting uh, features such, such as being local, which means that one synapse is modified only looking at the information of the neurons around it, so short range and not something uh, that needs to look at the whole network to modify one weight. Often you, have, you can have self-learning, which means that uh, really the synapse is modified by the dynamics of the system and not by an external explicit circuit. So you have a lot of nice things, but the problem is that these algorithms tend to have a low performance on a hard task. And uh, you can see here, for instance, you have the accuracy on different benchmark tasks that are larger and larger. And you see, so backpropagation is in black. And these are uh, other methods that are more inspired uh, from neuroscience. For instance, uh, back, um, for instance, uh, STDP, which is with spikes and unsupervised rule that many of you know. You see the accuracy really drops when you try to go to a complex task. So we have on one side an algorithm that works but seems impossible to implement in hardware. And on the other side, algorithms that have really attractive features, but don't have great performance. And so actually a, a very hot topic in artificial intelligence and computational neuroscience right now is to try to merge these algorithms to get the advantages of both. And there is even research on uh, uh, does the brain maybe does some kind of backpropagation since it works so well. So I encourage you to look at this article and this video that are very interesting on the topic. But uh, <laughs> really, the, the hope for, um, so for state-of-the-art algorithm, it's really this hope of merging the best of both worlds. And so this is really the, the dream that we have um, in our lab, is to uh, have this system that can really learn using its dynamics meaning that you will have approximation of gradients that are uh, computed with the dynamics and the weights will be themselves updated using the dynamics of a system. Uh, so uh, first step has been done in the direction, for instance, with this, uh, with this paper. Um, and so really this is uh, something that is very hard to do. Obviously we are only at the beginning, but it's very exciting. And I think it's uh, really an amazing, uh, it's an amazing opportunity. Actually, it's a really exciting challenge for us physicists because here we want really to build system that take advantage of the rich physics of spintronic devices. And so spintronic devices have this really uh, 
amazing nonlinear fast dynamics. And this is really uh, a way that this could be uh, a key ingredient to have this uh, self-learning uh, on chip at low power. And this would really open uh, amazing uh, paths, both on the fundamental level and on the application level. So uh, yes, this is the end of my talk. So uh, to recap, I have shown you a first experimental demonstration of communication between multiple layers of a network using nano devices. So first fully spintronic neural network. We have performed nonlinear classification experimentally with high accuracy. And uh, with simulations, I have shown you that we can do benchmark tasks and also natively uh, radio frequency applications. And these were real world signals, uh, by the way, the, the drones. It's a real application. And so the next task, as I have uh, told you, is to uh, scale up the network into a co-integrated CMOS MTJ chip, and also to implement this self-learning using the dynamics of the devices. And also we are hiring. So if you want to be part of this adventure, or if you know someone who would like to be part of this adventure, uh, please, uh, please contact me or Julie Gorlier, and uh, we would be really happy to, to have you on board. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh... The applause for you from the audience. <laughs> uh, uh, so thank you very much for always um, a very part of this talk. It was really fantastic on, on the wonderful uh, things that you guys are doing in the team. Um, so now we swear up and for questions. So I will uh, simply uh, please raise your hands and I will promote you to panelists so you can ask directly the questions. Uh, so let's see. There's a few people that are coming in. So uh, let me promote us a different order as people show up. Uh, I'll, uh, I think, uh, let me see if they come in. If not, uh, uh, I think Leonid, one second. Uh, if not, I'll just simply allow them to talk because they're not joining us. Some of them may not be able to join directly as, uh, so let's do that, okay. Um, uh, Leonid, uh, could you maybe unmute yourself and uh, give a talk or, uh, and ask your question directly? Leonid, could you unmute yourself? You have your hand raised up, but you need to unmute yourself. Or or maybe, oh, sorry, maybe he wrote the question. Okay, not yet. Let's go for the next one. Uh, um, so let's see, Alexander, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Okay, uh, so another one that is difficult to, am I not? Hello, okay, uh, you yeah, go ahead. Do, do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now, perfect. Uh, thanks for the talk, very interesting, but I missed a couple of points. How do you uh, physically perform the weights of the neural networks and bias? The weights and bias? Yes, how, uh, uh, how are they hardwarely performed in your neural network? Okay, so the weights, it's, the weight is carried by the synapse. So you change, where do I show it? you change the frequency of a synapse to change the weight. This is what we show here. You change the frequency, it changes your weight. Then for the bias, the bias is very simple because um, it's just an extra uh, a current that you, so when you, when you control your neuron, you send it a DC current, right? To make it oscillate. And so you just add a bias current. So this is a, is quite simple and the so of course in a real uh, in a real system you would need some like memory to store it or something but the biases are uh, are nice because it's just one by neuron so not too many of them and the weights here they are the resonance frequencies so does it mean you have to apply uh, like some uh, constant current to the to each of the neuron Yes, exactly. So this is this is why the neuron consume energy, and so mm -hmm. actually, depending on your type of network, uh, the network. So actually, most of the time, the consumption from the neuron will really not be the most important because uh, usually there are much more synapses. So even though the neuron consumes almost ten times more than the synapse. Usually there are much more than 10 times more synapses. So it's usually the synapses that are dominant, but on some, uh, on some uh, network, it could be the neurons. Okay. 
So yes, you, but yes, you need to uh, send current to the neuron. So the smaller, the less current, the better. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Yong Long, Ying Long, sorry. Uh, could you uh, mute yourself and ask your question? Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. you. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, maybe I have a, a stupid question. Uh, I want to know, does the training process uh, need a lot of data to train your hardware to do something? Uh, a lot of beta? A lot of what, sorry? A lot of training data, such as, such as in, yes, in yes, software yes. process. Software, yes, you train yes, yes. deep learning model. You need lots of data to do this thing. Yeah. Yes, 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 uh, completely. And this is, uh, this is an issue. So what I have shown today, it's really a direct mapping of a neural network. So the need for training data is as bad or as good as for uh, software deep learning. Uh, mm -hmm. When we go to a different kind of learning using dynamics, it might be different, but there is no, uh, for now, there is no demonstration that it would be better. Uh, people who work on task where you really have very little training, you try to go towards more things like unsupervised or semi-supervised learning. So we are also looking into it, but obviously it's harder to implement and the accuracy on task tend to be uh, for now uh, lower than when you have uh, much training data. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if Leonid, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? I You have your hand raised up, so I'm not sure if uh it's still there but uh if not anna um you ask a question but you said you have a mic but i have you here as a mic i'm not sure if you want to ask it directly or just read it out so anna ask um uh, how fast can operations with the networks be done uh is it determined by the switching frequencies of the ferromagnet in the mtjs or so is this is this is this a clock uh, synchronous clock that is there or what so so here there is no uh, synchronous clock so the the speed of the system is really set by the speed of the device so uh, because so what limits the speed here will be the establishment of the auto oscillation regime or the establishment of a spin diode regime so for now we have been quite conservative and said we need 100 period to have really to be sure we have full establishment. So for instance, if your um, device is at one gigahertz, then you need to wait 100 nanoseconds. So we are also investigating actually, if we do need to wait that long, or if we could actually uh, um, compute with less time. And uh, this would be maybe interesting also in this dynamics things. But for now we take this uh, conservative thing that we really wait for the steady state, 100 period, and so your slowest device uh, sets your speed. So remember I said there was this thing of having a large frequency range. So it's probable that there's a trade-off between how big you can multiplex, so how compact your network is, but how fast it is. So probably very interesting trade-off to look at. Very good. Uh, is there any further questions from the audience? I'll ask a few. Okay. Um, so one thing that I was wondering in terms of comparing this type of uh, training and algorithms and, and, and hardware uh, to the reservoir, is there an idea of combining them at all? Because you mentioned yes. about the training, but the other one is in total hybridizing them to get best of both the worlds. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are people who work on kind of uh, modern reservoir approaches where there are actually some, some training. For instance, there have been uh, interesting work uh, on like, where you train the uh, just like the threshold of the neurons and things like this, but it I mean it still does seem that basically the more you train, the better your accuracy. It okay. seems like, but then also maybe depending on how accurate your task is, you know that. But yeah, it seems for now really what brings the best accuracy uh, on state of the art task is backpropagation. And then it decreases really rapidly, but it's an open field. Uh. Okay, great. great. Um, okay, so any further questions, uh, Matthias? Anybody? Don't see, uh, Leonid, unfortunately, we're trying to contact you. <laughs> you have to stand up, but I, I don't see that he's you know he's answering. So maybe it's just 
you know, if you have a chance, uh, please send an email uh, to Alice, uh, <laughs> and uh, that will be fine. Uh, so I would like to thank all the hundred of you that were watching between here on Zoom and uh, and, uh, and online to, uh, in the YouTube channel. And Alice, thank you for a wonderful talk as always. Uh, looking forward also in next July uh, in the Gordon Conference to, to interact with you again. And uh, wonderful things that you guys are doing there. And uh, I expect to see a, a brain, uh, an artificial <laughs> brain brought to the Gordon Conference. So we can always. Yes, <laughs> I, have, I have pressure to show you new stuff in, uh, in July. I so am I very certain very there will be very new stuff. And also, yes, stuff, yes. of course, for many of the participants, this stuff will be new. So, also, you know, don't throw away. The baby with the, with, with the bath water, you still need that to, to bring some of these things in there because it will be part of the discussions, of course. Yeah. So thank you very much. Say how to Julie thank you. and the team. I will. And thank I will you so hope much to see you guys uh, next week uh, on during the seminar. Okay. Thank you all thank you for long. your questions and attention. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I'll start in the stream here now. Uh, bye, Hiram. I thank you. Okay.